Welcome to Hannity. It is 9 p.m. on the east coast of the United States, 9 a.m. right here in Hanoi. We're in Vietnam, where we are broadcasting live for the second straight day. Now, in just moments, I will speak one on one with Univision anchor Jorge Ramos. He was just detained by the Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro at the presidential palace. Oh, because the dictator couldn't handle the truth about socialism, an amazing story. Jorge confronted him about a citizen being so desperate. Remember the promises of socialism? They're pilfering garbage trucks for food. The dictator had Jorge detained, took his tapes and cell phone and cameras, and we'll have more on the desperate situation in Venezuela and this confrontation. But tonight, we begin right here in Vietnam, tomorrow. President Trump will kick off a series of historic meetings with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Both leaders arrived yesterday, President Force on Air Force One and Kim Jong-un via a 60-hour train ride. Somebody buy this guy a plane. Uh, I guess maybe it was in the shop getting repaired. But two years ago, remember the hate Trump media mob told you, we the people, the president, oh, he's leading us to nuclear annihilation in response to what? North Korea, their hostilities, rockets being fly, uh, flown over Japan, threatening Guam, threatening the continental U.S. Trump deployed multiple aircraft carrier strike groups in the region. He nicknamed Kim Jong-un Little Rocket Man. He reminded the despot about America's nuclear superiority. He squeezed North Korea's only real ally, China, with tariffs. He deployed the strategy. It's called peace through strength. And all while America's left, told you the sky was falling. He's going to start a nuclear holocaust. Um, local rocket man, fire and fury. My button's bigger than yours. This is how the media reacted. The idea of a nuclear showdown with North Korea keeps you up at night. I would recommend deleting your Twitter app. He is not merely being cavalier with a threat about nuclear war. He's being cavalier in a way that it makes him seem demented. These are the messages from a person who is not well, from a leader who is not fit for office. President Trump is goading Kim Jong-un to uh, test a nuclear missile again, to uh, prove its reliability, to show him wrong. And fundamentally, I think it comes across as two kindergartners who are jostling each other, except that each has nuclear weapons. Well, here's uh, 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 too late after 100,000 yeah. Americans die. After a nuclear holocaust. Or after a million die in Seattle. And that's where we are. This he, is not an exaggeration. Trump's comments about nuclear weapons have experts worried he could literally inadvertently trigger a catastrophe. They said the same thing when Reagan called the former Soviet Union the evil empire. And per usual, and he challenged Gorbachev, tear down this wall. They're completely wrong again and again. And as you might have noticed, there's no nuclear holocaust. In fact, quite the opposite. What have we seen? North Korea completely stopping, firing ballistic missiles over Japan, threatening the region, threatening Guam, threatening the continental United States. They returned the remains of U.S. servicemen, brave heroes who died in battle during the Korean War. They agreed to negotiate the denuclearization of the entire Korean peninsula. Oh, and hostages were returned. A huge deal. And it's not just about North Korea. Now China is being held accountable for its rampant intellectual property theft. And because of the real serious threat of ongoing tariffs, well, guess what? New, better trade deals that help Americans, that help farmers, that help manufacturers, that help our car industry are now on the table. Despite all this success, of course, the hate Trump, media mob, and Democrats publicly rooting for the president to fail in his upcoming negotiations with Kim Jong-un. We have eight U.S. senators, this is a joke, releasing an open letter to the president, bashing him for his diplomatic efforts, insinuating our president is a liar. Well, let's look at the hate Trump, media mob's obsession with a months-old statement from the president, oh, that he and Kim fell in love during their first encounter. Okay, let me translate this for anyone in the media who's too stupid to figure it out on their own, who never left the comforts of their little TV studios that are way overpaid. The president developed a beneficial working relationship with someone we're trying to negotiate with. By the way, if we can stop North Korea from threatening the entire region, that would be a good thing. That's when nuclear annihilation is just a button away if we don't fix it. So let's face it. Here's the sad reality. We have the left in this country, Democrats, mainstream media. They don't obviously want the president to succeed, not just on this issue. Even when the safety and security 
of the American people is on the line. This is sick. Their psychotic hatred of this president is more important to them than the well-being of South Koreans, the entire region, and Americans. Now, if that wasn't the case, remember, they would fund the wall on the southern border like they were willing to do in Obama's second term. But if Trump's doing it, it's immoral. If that wasn't the case, they could not have tried to ruin Judge Kavanaugh's life, smear, slander, besmirchment during their botched attempt to block his nomination. If that wasn't the case, they would not have voted against the Born Alive bill, which would have protected living infants who survived a botched abortion. Really? Pretty heartless. And all the Democratic presidential candidates in the Senate voted against this bill, all of them. Now, that brings us to tonight's Hannity history lesson. While the left is actively rooting against President Trump, because that then gets in the way of their desire for power, well, their own track record in foreign policy has been an absolute disgrace. Frankly, an utter failure. Their failed strategy can be summed up with two words, international bribery. If only we suck up to dictators and pay them money, maybe they'll like us. 1994, then President Bill Clinton bragging about giving North Korea the world in exchange for just a promise not to build a nuke. Didn't last long. Take a look. This is a good deal for the United States. North Korea will freeze and then dismantle its nuclear program. South Korea and our other allies will be better protected. The entire world will be safer as we slow the spread of nuclear weapons. South Korea, with support from Japan and other nations, will bear most of the cost of providing North Korea with fuel to make up for the nuclear energy it is losing. And they will pay for an alternative power system for North Korea that will allow them to produce electricity while making it much harder for them to produce nuclear weapons. The United States and international inspectors will carefully monitor North Korea to make sure it keeps its commitments. Only as it does so will North Korea fully join the community of nations. Well, it wasn't a good deal for the American people because North Korea took the money and ran, and today, yeah, they have a nuclear weapons arsenal. President Trump is now stuck cleaning up his mess. And sadly, Obama didn't learn from Clinton's abject foreign policy failures. Remember in 2015, then President Obama tried to bribe the world's leading sponsor of terrorism with $150 billion in cash and other currency that they dumped on a tarmac in Iran for the mullahs of Iran that say death to America and death to Israel and burn our flags. What do we get in return? We got a promise again that they wouldn't develop nuclear weapons for a few years. President Obama called it an unprecedented achievement in stupidity, but Iran used that money. What? We now know to fund terrorism all over the Middle East as proxies of wars all over the place, killing so many innocent humans in the process, killing innocent civilians around the world. Iran still publicly plotting the annihilation of Israel, still burning the U.S. flag, still chanting death to America, death to Israel. And Obama's flawed nuclear deal, thankfully, because of President Trump, is now totally obsolete. If we don't learn from the past, yes, we're doomed to repeat it. Just like Reagan peace through strength, we can learn from success as well. And that's why the president will only open up, open up the spigot of economic opportunity in North Korea if Kim Jong-un agrees to join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which opens up his country to regular, unabated checks on his nuclear program. And he'll help his people out in the meantime. And he also has to agree to phase out and dismantle all of his nuclear weapons. Accountability, verification, or no deal. Now, as a country that is learning from our past failures is critically important, not just abroad, but right here in America, within the United States, our country. In 2010, when former President Obama and his fellow Democrats rammed Obamacare down your throat, remember, they made a lot of promises again and again. Keep your doctor, keep your plan, and save less and lower drug prices. Well, a lot of people lost their doctors, lost their plans, and everybody's paying more. All Americans will be insured. Didn't happen. Health care costs have skyrocketed. Some Americans only have one plan. 27 million Americans today still remain uninsured. Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, nearly every other far-left radical Democrat is pushing Obamacare on steroids, human growth hormone, times a million. They're literally calling for every American to lose. You cannot have private health insurance and let 
our ever so competent federal government, the ones that gave us Obamacare, handle it all. Take a look. Will these people be able to keep their health insurance plans, their private plans, no. through their employers if there is a Medicare for all program that you endorse? What they will, what will change in their plans is the color of their card. So instead of having a Blue Cross Blue Shield card, instead of having a United Health Insurance card, they're going to have a Medicare card. All right, that multi-trillion dollar big government takeover, just one small part of what is now the radical extremist Democratic Socialist 2020 agenda. Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren pushing widespread reparations. Also, almost every single Democratic candidate right now is backing this insane Green New Deal. Free everything for everybody. Free child care, free housing, free health E food from government healthy food, free vacations, free family leave, free health care, but you can't have a private insurer, free, free, free. Oh, and retirement. And you don't even have to work. Oh, yeah, by the way, no more oil, no more gas, no more airplanes, no more cows, no more powered cars, uh, and the government will rebuild every single building in America for energy efficiency. Well, all in 10 years, and by the way, we have our first cost estimate at a meager, oh, up to $94 trillion, even though the world, of course, is supposed to end in 12 years, according to Ocasio-Cortez. Now, this plan would wreck the United States. It would be an unmitigated disaster, nothing but a path to poverty. It would destroy the greatest wealth and innovation-producing system that mankind has ever seen, it's called capitalism, and that's not all. The radical plans keep coming and coming. It's open borders, eliminate ICE, and if they get their way, only the government gets to have the Second Amendment right. In fact, as we speak, House Democrats, they are prepping a bill that would criminalize many gun sales. And let's never forget their unified opposition to living humans surviving abortions. This is the new extreme radical Democratic Socialist Party. All Democratic senators running for president voted against the Born Alive Survivors Protection Act. Wow, the most innocent among us. Our government doesn't protect babies living on their own. What's the point? All of these radical plans, they have one common theme, government power. Democrats want to bribe you, we, the American people. They want to take away all of your fear, convince you that giving up basic fundamental rights in exchange for security, lofty government promises, pre-everything. Now, it's time tonight we call on everyone in America. Learn from history, bribing dictators and kissing up to them never works. Socialism always ends in death, poverty and destruction for all. We'll have a lot more coming up in the course of the show. But first, let's preview what is about to go down tomorrow in our nation's swamp. So, while the president is here in Vietnam, the president's former attorney, Michael Cohn, is going to testify in public three days in a row. One, two, three. Okay? Tomorrow is the only public one before the House Oversight Committee. He's going to be grilled uh, by some of the worst Trump haters like Ocasio Cortez, Congresswoman Tlaib, and others. Now, keep in mind, among other issues, Michael Cohn did plead guilty, lying to Congress. It wasn't long ago that prominent Democrats hated Michael Cohn called him out repeatedly for being a liar. Now they're his best friend. Take a look. As far as Michael Cohen's credibility, Rudy Giuliani described him as a proven liar. I think that Michael Cohen, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump have about the same amount of credibility. They all use at best situational ethics, and it, uh, but it probably more likely they just lie constantly. So now Michael Cohn is the Democrats' new best friend forever. Sadly, he's going to report to prison in May to serve a multi-year sentence. He, and you know what? He and his family have been through an awful lot. Frankly, hell. And Democrats, in my opinion, are just shamefully using him as a political prop, not to learn anything new, but once again to bludgeon President Trump, to make him look bad. While he's in the middle of high stakes, historic negotiations abroad here in Vietnam to keep the world safer. Whatever happened to politics ending at the water's edge? You know, it is a pretty heartless act by a group of people just blinded by all things Trump. And as of for tomorrow, as a kangaroo court plays out on Capitol Hill,
President Trump is going to be fighting for America's interest abroad, flying 25 hours to try and make the world a safer place, keeping the country, the citizens of the United States safe in the process. Pretty despicable. Joining us now, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, California Congressman Devin Nunes. Uh, good to see you both. Good Congressman Jordan, let's start with you. So in the middle of what is really important, are really important issues for the safety security yep. of the world, rockets haven't been fired over Japan in 15 months, no more threats to America, Guam, the entire Korean Peninsula. Um, Michael Cohn gets front and center coverage by the Democrats. Not one, but three days in a row in the middle of these negotiations? Yeah. yeah, Sean, look, you're exactly right. While the president's working to make the world safer, the Democrats' first announced witness of the 116th Congress is a guy who is going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. They're giving a forum to a guy who lied to banks, lied to the IRS, lied to all kinds of folks, but tomorrow he'll be given center stage to spread more lies about the commander-in-chief of our country, again, while the commander-in-chief, while the president of the United States is working to make the world safer in meeting with Kim there in Vietnam. You know, Congressman Nunes, um, first of all, why would anybody that is, has Michael Cohn's interest at heart, why would they allow him to do this at this point when he's now got it settled? Is he going to be putting himself potentially in greater jeopardy if he says something that contradicts what he said before? Will there be another investigation or some type of threat? Does he have an immunity deal in this case? Well, Sean, congratulations on being in, in Vietnam on a very august occasion, uh, hopefully historical. Uh, tomorrow is going to be Michael Cohen live in front of Jim Jordan's committee. On Thursday, unfortunately, it's going to be behind closed doors uh, in a classified setting. And one of the challenges we have here is we've already had Michael Cohen in. He's been prosecuted. He's been prosecuted for lying to the FBI, pled guilty. I mean, I'm sorry, lying to Congress. So why is he testifying behind closed doors to the House Intelligence Committee? This is not a man who has any classified information whatsoever. Uh, and what I'm concerned about is, is that they will twist things around. They'll take things that, that happen because they'll know what publicly happens tomorrow. And then in our committee, they're going to take things take what they want and selectively leak. And so we'll be dealing with that problem here on Thursday night, I can guarantee you. Sean, Will it be this, under this, oath? Yeah, oh yeah, he'll be under oath. Sean, this is the best they got. This is all they got. And, and remember, this is step one in their process to, to go to impeachment and try to remove the president from office. Understand what happened last week. Last week in Chairman Jerry Nadler's district, Tom Steyer, mega donor for the Democrats, organized a town hall to encourage Mr. Nadler to pursue impeachment. Last night in Baltimore, Tom Steyer organized a town hall in Elijah Cummings district to encourage impeachment. This is, their, this is the best they got, a guy who is going to prison for lying to Congress. This is how they're going to launch their effort to ultimately get to impeaching the president. That is how desperate they are, but it starts tomorrow. While the president is here in Vietnam, exactly. exactly, you know, trying to negotiate the denuclearization of the, of the Korean Peninsula is really outrageous. Congressman Nunes, one question. So many people keep asking me, we've been able to slowly unravel this onion, take a layer off a day as it relates to the deep state. We now know James Baker, the general counsel, top lawyer of the FBI under Comey, thought that Hillary should be indicted. We know obstruction would be a slam dunk case. We are waiting on FISA information, 302s, interviews, gang of aid information. When are we going to get all of that? So here's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the last phase of our investigation and laying out everything else that we have left to do. We're going to be working with Jim Jordan and Doug Collins. So the Republicans are going to have the task force that we set up in the last Congress is continuing. It's going to take declassification by the president. I think it's going to take full transparency. We have all of this talk about the, whether or not the Mueller report is going to be transparent and going to be released. I have no problem with that as long as it's not just the Mueller report. It's all the interviews, uh, any informants that they had both that they of were you running. Have seen we this. want to know all of that. We, both of you know that Bruce Orr in August warned everybody Hillary bought the dossier. It, it was not verified or corroborated and that Christopher Steele hated President Trump. Um, yeah. Just, re they signed just off remember, on it Sean, four times. Yeah. I, wanna, I, I just want you to remember, Comey and others have said that, that it wasn't the dossier, that the dossier only played a small part of that FISA application. It's not what Andrew McCabe so, said. Without a well, dossier, no FISA. 
Right. But remember what, what I've said. It's bad enough that they've, they've used the dossier. The rest of the crap that they used is even worse. And that's what we want declassified. Yeah. Bruce Orr uh, also Jordan, talked to Andrew. Word. Bruce Orr also talked to Andrew Wiseman before he got put on the special counsel's team about the bias Christopher Steele had against President Trump when they launched this whole darn thing. Right. Real, real quick question. Is the Mueller report, you've seen everything, both of you. Do you expect it's going to be anticlimactic and there's no collusion? Do you agree uh, with that assessment, Devin Nunes? Well, I think what you have to see is, is what the Mueller supporters are continuing to do out there. So they're, they're telegraphing already right now that there's nothing going to, that nothing's going to be in there. Now, look, we know nothing's going to be in there because there was no evidence of it. collusion and conspiracy. It's, it's, it was ridiculous from the beginning. The only thing they ever had was the information that the Clinton campaign had Sean, paid for. Sean, all the way up until the date James Comey is fired, he told us there was still no evidence of any collusion whatsoever. We know there's not going to be any collusion in this final report. Great, but there was collusion. Hillary bought and paid for Russian lies, and then it was used to stop a well, first influence an election in her favor, and then later to bludgeon a duly elected president and unseat him. Biggest abuse of power scandal ever. Thank you both. All right, the Democrats' party of late-term abortion. Today, they blocked a bill on infanticide. Newt Gingrich will join us, and later Jorge Ramos detained in Venezuela. Thankfully, he's safe. He'll tell his story exclusively. Straight ahead. All right, so the Democrats' far-left, extreme, radical agenda now on abortion, hitting new levels of radicalism. Quick reminder, by the way, recent developments. First, New York passed a law allowing abortion up to the mother's due date. Then a barbaric proposal, remember, in Virginia, nearly succeeded, would have allowed an abortion while a woman begins labor. And remember, disgraced, Virginia Democratic Governor Ralph Northam took it even a step further when describing the process for letting a baby, well, first the baby's going to be born, we'll make the baby comfortable, and then the mother will decide whether or not we resuscitate it or give it any medical aid. Now, Senate Democrats, they have blocked the GOP back born alive bill. That will provide medical care to infants who survive failed abortions. Let's be clear here. That's infanticide, plain and simple. And refusing to care for a child born alive, living independently, has the support of all 2020 Senate Democratic hopefuls, but they couldn't be more out of touch with the American people. Now, President Trump responded. He tweeted out, quote, Senate Democrats just voted against legislation to prevent the killing of newborn infant children. Democratic position on abortion is now so extreme, they don't mind literally executing babies after birth. Then added, quote, this will be remembered as one of the most shocking votes in the history of Congress. And it looks like, well, Illinois may be next. Pro-life group is warning that a new proposal would make the state the, quote, abortion capital of America. This and more on Democratic extremism, former Speaker of the House and new host of Newt's World podcast. Look at that. It's amazing. We're very happy to have back Fox News contributor Newt Gingrich. I don't even know what to say here. You know, I, I, I don't think people could do this to a puppy or a kitten, what they're describing, what they're voting for, well, what they're, they're supporting well, here. Well, I think most liberal Democrats would be more upset if you did it to a puppy or a kitten than if you do it to a baby. I mean, it's a little hard to understand what's happened psychologically uh, to the Democratic Party that you could have so, such a lockstep group of people I think all but three of the Democratic senators voted in effect to allow the killing of babies who are already born. Uh, the position taken, as you point out, by, by the governor of Virginia is that it's really okay because we'll keep the baby comfortable while we decide whether or not to kill it. I mean, this is just pure infanticide in a way which is unthinkable in most of the world. And if this was a foreign country and we were describing a foreign country which allowed babies to be killed after they were born, uh, even most liberals would be shocked and horrified. But what you're seeing right now, and, and I don't know whether it's just the natural maturation of the left over the last 40 years or partially in reaction to Trump, on almost every front, they now feel compelled to rush to the most extreme positions, even if they're crazy. Uh, somebody said the other day that They've now become literally 
the party of death and taxes. Uh, and I think that there's a lot to that. And I can't understand at a practical level what they think they're doing, but also I can't understand morally, you know, one or two people, yeah, but to have every Democratic presidential candidate vote that it's okay to kill babies after they're born uh, puts them in such a small minority, I, I don't quite see how they think they're going to create a winning campaign. Mr. Speaker, add to that, we're going to get rid of airplanes, cows, we're going to rebuild every home, everything's free. Um, not that the government runs a lot well, college and education and jobs and security and vacations and healthy food and, you know, health care, uh, but you can't have your own. What has happened here? Because the fact that they're so open about these beliefs, to me, is political suicide. Well, I, th I think what you've had happen is that in a small number of congressional districts, mostly in the inner city, a uh, number of people have won with very tiny margins. If you look at uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, I think that her total share of the vote was 19 percent, but there was such a small turnout that 19 percent could elect her. Um, the various cartoons that are now on the Internet describing her in ways that are just funny uh, fit what's happening. This is a person who, who doesn't know anything, doesn't seem to want to learn anything, but frankly, it's not just because she's, you know, a young, interesting woman. Look at Bernie Sanders. I mean, here's a guy who's been around forever. He can't even bring himself to say that Maduro in Venezuela is a dictator. Now, you look at his entire lifetime of apologizing for the Soviet Union, apologizing for Fidel Castro. Uh, Bernie Sanders has never met a left winger he didn't like. And so you have this whole thing coming together, partially, I think, a reaction to Hillary Clinton. Uh, that she was so unacceptable uh, to most liberals that they've gone further to the left in response, partially in react to Donald Trump, who, again, is from the standpoint of a left winger, is so unacceptable. But I'm, I've been around long enough. What I'm reminded of is uh, George McGovern in 1972 and the collapse of the Democratic Party as people began to realize, I mean, you go around the country, I don't think there's a single state, not one, in which they can get a majority in favor of killing babies after they're born. Mr. Speaker, I'm here in Vietnam. I'm in Hanoi. It takes 26 hours to get here. Um, just saying, I, and I'm glad to be here. The president tomorrow will be trying to negotiate. The president's already gotten hostages back, remains back. Uh, he has, you know, no more rockets are being fired. I think that's a good thing for the world, but at the same time, the Democrats are holding three days of hearings tomorrow public while the president's in the middle of negotiations putting Michael Cohn out there. Whatever happened to politics ends at the water's edge. Look, I think you just have to assume that the Democratic Party has lost any sense of patriotism, any sense of balance, any sense of propriety. Uh, and, and you would think when you, when you deal with something like the Korean War, the nuclear weapons in North Korea, the potential to maybe get a breakthrough. It might work, it may not work, but boy, it's sure a courageous step. You would think that most of the Democrats would have said, well, you know, we can do this next week when he comes back home. Uh, but it tells you that the, the bitterness, the, 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 the hatred, frankly, is so deep that they can't see beyond their own uh, fratricidal warfare. Very dangerous for the country, I think. I agree with you. Uh, all right, Mr. Speaker, we're going to watch a um, little scary moment for the country, and we appreciate you being with us. All right, when we come back, not only are the Democrats doing Michael Cohen for three days in a row, undermining the president's summit, but they're also spending all week trying to block the president's border emergency declaration. They won't win. Geraldo, Dan Bongino, also Jorge Ramos detained after asking the Venezuelan dictator some tough questions. Thankfully, he's been released. He'll join us, share his story. What went down? Next. All right, last week, a Massachusetts woman allegedly assaulted a young man in a restaurant. Why? Wearing a Make America Great Again hat. Oh, the great trigger of our day. Turns out, we are now learning the suspect is an illegal immigrant from Brazil, now in ICE custody. Meanwhile, the House just passed a resolution to nullify the president's national emergency declaration. Now it goes to the Senate. 
doesn't look like it, they will be able to overcome a presidential veto. Joining us now with Reaction, Fox News correspondent at large, Geraldo Rivera, and right here on set in Hanoi, Vietnam, Fox News contributor Dan Bongino. We'll go to you first. Um, I'm looking at this, yeah. another thing they're working on this week. Let's try, if 90% of heroin coming into the country and fentanyl and 4,000 homicides, and 10,000 sexual assaults and 100 or 30,000 sexual assaults and 100,000 violent assaults is not an emergency. Yeah, I mean, can we just be candid? You have to be an imbecile to believe there's not an emergency on our southern border. I mean, either you're not processing right or you're such a political animal that the fact that there isn't, you know what was, was weird about this, Sean, is when it, when it came to the, the, the obvious emergency situation where those children tragically died, the Democrats were all over the fact that it was an emergency. But now that, and that was an unquestioned human tragedy. Now that that's passed and it's not to be used for political purposes anymore, now it's not an emergency. And by the way, Trump's got them all smoked on this anyway. Between the $1.3 billion allocated, the Milcon budget, and the Treasury funds he's oh. got, he's already got the $5 billion. They can play all they want with yeah. all this national emergency And everything emergency else stuff. they actually funded. Yeah, yeah, and everything else. So he's already got the $5 billion he needs yeah. while they play around. And, and Geraldo, as the president says, um, keep building the wall. Finish the wall. They've started. They're repairing. It's building. It's being built. Even you recognize that this is a very <laughs> Even important me. issue. Even me, who got left behind when you take Bongino to Vietnam, I get left behind. Even me. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. We invited uh, you, no way. if I recall. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. You invited me to the Vietnam <laughs> restaurant across the street, maybe. <laughs> oh, my no, the, gosh. The president's that... wall. <laughs> The president's wall is going to be built, Sean. There's no way they can stop mm -hmm. it. Uh, you know, put, put aside the, uh, the merits of the issue. The president has the power. Uh, the Congress can pass this resolution. There is no way they're going to get two-thirds of both the House and the Senate to override a presidential veto. Unless one of the lawsuits succeeds, and I don't believe that's going to happen either, the wall well, will be built. Ultimately, it's going to happen. But really, this is what they do in the president's here in Vietnam, Geraldo? Um, that coupled with their radical Awful. New Deal proposals, late-term abortion, don't you think they're kind of marginalizing themselves? I'm, so, I'm sick in my stomach that they are scheduling Michael Cohen's testimony for tomorrow. I mean, the fact that they are putting this tabloid person, you feel much more sympathetic toward him than I do. Uh, this is a lawyer who has betrayed his client, uh, and, and uh, you know, everything about him just reeks of kind of uh, sleaziness. Well, well, where is attorney him on as the president? Where, where, where is attorney it? client privilege? The president is on, he stands on the cusp of a potential historic breakthrough, reducing the threat of nuclear war on Earth, uh, threatening tens of millions of people. MSNBC and CNN barely mentioned Korea, barely mentioned the summit, barely it's mentioned the states. All right, let me. Just for Michael Damn. Cohen, it's awful. You know, it really makes you wonder right now, this Cohen thing, what side the Democrats are on. And it really pains me to say that, being at this historic summit right now. I mean, Geraldo is actually right. We have the potential for a historic nuclear breakthrough with a, a country who just, what, a year ago was threatening to take out portions of Hawaii and Guam. And we're doing taxi cab confessions on Capitol Hill with Michael Cohen. Absolutely <laughs> disgraceful. What side? Right, right, right. We're all these are all In the end, the American people going to. Sean, the optics here are awful. The foil effect. Is, yeah, of course. They're talking taxi cab confessions. We're denuclearizing the Korean yeah. Peninsula here. All right, Geraldo, uh, you're invited yeah. on every trip moving forward if you didn't get the invitation. All right, up next. Jorge Ramos, detained by Venezuela's brutal dictator, didn't like his question. He's going to share that story coming up next. Oh, and your email on my scooter ride. Oh, boy. Straight ahead. All right, as we continue from Hanoi in Vietnam, well, yesterday, journalists Jorge Ramos and Univision staffers, they were detained at the presidential palace in Venezuela after an interview with Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro. Now, apparently, Maduro didn't like the questions that were asked and ended the interview when Jorge Ramos showed him this video of hungry Venezuelans eating out of a garbage truck. After being held for three hours, the group was thankfully released. Univision News anchor Jorge Ramos joins us now. Uh, first of all, I'm glad you're out. Uh, I was nervous about what was happening, and I know we disagree, too. but I don't disagree on protecting all Americans, whoever they are, wherever they are. And I said it last night, and I mean it. I'm saying it to you personally. And, and I want to thank you personally, Sean. I know that we have many differences on immigration and put those differences aside. Because when, when I needed that support the most, 
I heard that you were talking about us in Venezuela, and that was incredibly important. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, Sean. Thanks so much to Fox News, because uh, and on those moments when you are detained in a dictatorship, when there's no one to help you, and you see a tweet or you see a report from Fox News, or from an American media, you know that you are not alone. And we felt that we were not alone. So, muchas gracias. Yeah, listen, uh, muy bien. Uh, I'm not great with my... I studied it in school <laughs> three years, but it's not great, Jorge. Um, let's tell everybody what happened, because they took your tapes. By the way, those are real videos of real Venezuelans. It should be one of the yeah. richest countries in the entire world that are eating out of garbage trucks. And that is widespread. And I applaud you for calling attention to the suffering of human beings. This isn't politics to me. It, it, it is terrible what's happening right now in, in Venezuela. There's a, a humanitarian crisis. The minimum wage, Sean, is $5. Not $5 an hour or $5 a day, $5 a month. That's the minimum wage. So that, that's why there's so much hunger. We, I had the interview with Nicolás Maduro, it lasted about 17 minutes. I think it was a strong interview. It was, it was all right. But then I show him, the kids that you just showed um, on, a, on a garbage truck, and, and he just couldn't stand it. He stood up, he tried to cover um, the, the image so the cameras wouldn't be able to see it. And then I told him, uh, Mr. Maduro, I didn't call him president, I, I called him Mr. Maduro, uh, what are you doing? Why don't you answer the questions? What you are doing is what dictators do. And then, and then he left, one of his ministers came back, they confiscated uh, four cameras, Sean, they took our tape cards where we actually store the, the interviews, and then they detained us for two hours. They took away uh, our cell phones, and at this point, at this point, we don't have the cameras, we don't have the interview, and they gave my uh, cell back, although all the cell phones from my colleagues, they're still in Venezuela. You know, we're having a debate in this country, and I, I, you, everyone knows we have a well-documented disagreement on immigration and border security and American sovereignty and American law. We'll put that aside. But, mm -hmm. you know, I look at a country like Venezuela, all the grandiose promises, we'll take care of everything, we'll do everything, government, socialism, it fails. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious, as you see this, these arguments being made in our country, uh, about 70 percent tax rates, marginal rates, uh, guaranteed education, health care, jobs, security, everything, college. I'm wondering if you see the dangers as I do, how socialism does almost universally lead to poverty and false promises. What I saw in Venezuela is that the 20-year-old revolution, it started with Hugo Chavez in 1999, has failed completely. You have uh, more than 3 million Venezuelans living in the country. Inflation is 1 million percent. If they pay 1 Bolivar today, it will be a million Bolivars in, in a year from now. And people are dying. I went to a hospital, Hospital Vargas, and then um, one woman, uh, she has lost a family member. And you know why? Because they didn't have $30 to pay for antibiotics. So the experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. And you know something, I, I really appreciate the, the freedom and the liberties that we have here in the United States. You know, uh, we know that, that I have my differences with, with President Trump, but this is the difference. You can criticize the President of the United States, and I can go home and nothing happens to me, Sean. But if I criticize yeah. the dictator of Venezuela, they confiscate uh, my cameras, they take my it's interviews, terrible. they detain me, and then they expel me from the country. Those are two big, big differences. The last thing I'll add, and this is a political point that I'll make, you know, sure. Obama, eight years, 13 million more Americans on food stamps, eight million more in poverty. Obamacare, millions lost their doctors, their plans, they have one option, and everybody paid more. Those are the false promises, I think, of socialism and the danger. And under Donald Trump, look at this record low unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, women in the workplace. And I come from very blue collar roots. I want the forgotten men and women in this country and frankly the world to have the blessings of freedom that we, we take for granted, as I can see here in Vietnam, a lot of poverty. And I understand your political point, and if you allow me, in, in this case, especially for this interview, about 25 uh, seconds. I, I'll, I'll, I'll concentrate on what I saw in Venezuela. And healthcare in Venezuela, the socialist healthcare in Venezuela, is 
is terrible. I mean, I, I saw this woman who just didn't have enough money for antibiotics. I saw a family whose 15 year old Christian uh, is dying because they couldn't do blood tests in the hospital. So they took uh, his blood in a tooth and they put it in a, in a glass with ice and they had to take it to another place and, and the boy most likely will die very soon simply because they don't have enough medicines. So that's what's happening with the revolution, mm -hmm. the Venezuelan revolution right now with Nicolas Maduro. We may disagree on immigration very strongly, but we agree on humanitarian issues and we do. the and poverty and what's happened there. Uh, I'm glad you're out. Uh, next time we're going to have another fight. So you know, but we're we'll, glad you're we'll, home. So we'll thanks. have a fight. And first, and let me thank the U.S. Department, um, the State Department, and, and the American Embassy in Caracas. Thanks to them, um, I'm yeah. here today in Miami. I think you should just say, I love Donald Trump, and it'll all be over. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> welcome home. Not today. Not today, Sean. Thank I you understand. so much. I understand. All right. Thank we're you. glad you're out. Thank you. Coming up next, big announcement you don't want to miss. And yeah, a lot of you had email about my scooter trip. Some of it's hilarious. Next, straight ahead. All right. Last night, we aired footage from my now, I guess, infamous shows I have a sense of humor scooter ride in Hanoi. Well, some of you had some very strong opinions about that. One viewer wrote, Love you, Sean. Please be careful with all the traffic. Be safe. Thanks for supporting our president. God bless you and President Trump. Thank you very much. Diane remarked, you are, <laughs> who picked this? I'm not saying this. I am not, anyway, love the glasses. You should wear your hair like that on the show. Edward asked, where's your helmet, Hannity? Sorry, no helmets. Uh, and before we go, by the way, we do have a big announcement in that UC Berkeley campus assault case, the University of California, has concluded its investigation into the February 19th assault on conservative activist Hayden Williams that the media ignored and is seeking a felony warrant for the identified suspect. If a warrant is issued, police will pursue his arrest. We're going to follow this closely and, of course, bring you every update. Also, finally, we do have a big announcement. And make sure to tune in to this program Thursday night, one-on-one, -on -one, exclusive interview with President Trump right after his second historic summit with North Korea's Kim Jong-un. It's an exclusive interview you'll only see here on Hannity, and we look forward to that. We also, you would think that the rest of the country would forget about red and blue and forget about conservative, liberal, and Republican, Democrat. Maybe we should really hope for the safety and security of our children in the world that the president succeeds, not hate him like they do over everything, even if he cured cancer. All right, thank you for being with us. We'll never be the hate Trump media. Let not your heart be troubled.